Hi everybody, Jacek Bartosiak is speaking Strategy and Future. Here uh, he, today with me is Albert Świdziński, Director of Analysis at Strategy and Future. And we're going to talk about the current events in the Middle East and elsewhere. Hi Albert, how are you? Hi Jacek, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Business is good as well. Things are interesting in the world. So, Yeah, people dealing with geopolitics as we do are overwhelmed with events and phenomena that emerge all around wherever you look be it in europe and the uh, concept of you know the uniting europe be it in the us both domestically and internationally be it in the middle east or the far east or in the pacific as the americans prefer to say these days everything is happening now there is a major re reshuffle of balance of power across the world and also a major reshuffle of the uh, dominating narrative of how the world should operate in line with what all Henry Kissinger used to say in his book called Diplomacy, the, you know, the overriding narrative that cement, that glue the party and create the parties and create the proper niche, the proper environment for the balancing, for the balance of power. And that stabilized the system. Everything is gone now. So, Albert, let's start with the Middle East. What do you think of all this happening? We are recording on the 17th of October at noon, Warsaw time, Central European time. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll go on back to what you said about reshuffling in the world. I, uh, I've read a report by CRS, Congressional Research Service, to the Congress about great power competition. And it begins with a statement that right now the discussion has shifted and features predominantly uh, considerations about how grand strategy and geopolitics is the starting point for understanding and approaching a grand power rivalry between US, China, and Russia, which is an interesting perspective. I mean, it's... Uh, it's something we did for years and something I'm sure we subscribe to. But here in Poland, this is something that people still sort of refuse to understand and admit that this is the unfortunate reality. And the time of constructivism and optimism of the 90s and 2000s is over, which is, you know, it's, it's again, obvious for us, but quite a shocker for a lot of people in, in Europe. And it is interesting how countries will approach this and what kind of reactions this shock will generate, because I think it's quite clear that the currently presiding elites, I'm not sure those people are capable of functioning in this environment, in such a non-permissive environment. So it's interesting how the future generation of, of stakeholders and policymakers will look like, because I don't think Ursula von der Leyen can handle the heat. But when it comes to, uh, so that was a little, you know, byline. As to Middle East, yeah, look, I mean, I wouldn't want to focus too granularly, too granular, granularly, I guess. It's a difficult word for Eastern Europeans. As to what is the dynamics between Hamas and Israel and then Hezbollah and then Iran and then Saudi Arabia, I'm, I'm far from being an expert. But I think the general observation is that once you see a power vacuum forming, and that power vacuum is clearly forming because the U.S. has limited resources and seemingly unlimited number of concerns. And leverages, and leverages. They ran out of leverages, basically. After the uh, devastating war in Mesopotamia, what we see, I think, on a strategic level is the Kindleberger trap, where the uh, ebbing power, external it power, is lens. leaving the vacuum. And uh, because there are no great powers in the Middle East itself, as opposed to Europe, I'll get back to it later on the, the uh, Asia. In Asia, there are no so external powers um, have leverages on events there, but there is a Kindleberg trap. So there's a vacuum, this reshuffle between Iran, Saudi Arabia, with the China, uh, you know, as midwife of doing it. Then there is a major uh, attempt to to divert it by Israeli and US by trying to take uh, Saudis out of this deal by proposing the enrichment of uranium and stuff in the recent weeks. And it is broken now, by the way, because of the uh, what happened uh, between, you know, the Gaza Strip and uh, southern uh, Israel. 
so this is all happening but let's let's focus on the strategic level let's uh, let's do it you know let's talk for example about the differences between intermarium where we live and the middle east in terms of the uh, existence and uh, presence of great power so what are the differences uh, in predicting the future uh, stemming from the fact that there are no residing great powers in the middle east uh, itself what does, but at the same uh, time, compared to Germany or European Union and to Russia uh, in Europe. But at the same time, well, you know, people look for external uh, external guarantors, right? That's the problem. And the problem of the U.S. no longer being able, like ev- it becomes evident that the U.S. no longer is able to stabilize the region. So you have China, you know, at least on surface level, brokering some sort of agreement a couple months ago between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You had then again, Saudis trying to um, negotiate the price they hedge. for they hedge. They hedge. hedging, exactly, yeah, hedging uh, with the U.S. Mm, over over you know security guarantees and access to you know entire fuel cycle uh, over having a control over entire fuel cycle for for nuclear energy generation in return for stabilizing and normalizing ties, uh, relations with Israel. Um, it's also very interesting, I think, on a on certain level that the U.S. was even willing to entertain this idea. Because historically, I mean, Francis Gavin, which I respect greatly, and I hope we'll get him on one of the podcasts in the future, has pointed out that inhibition, as an inhibition of, of possession of nuclear arms, has been one of three basic vectors of U.S. policy. Uh, he places it on, on, you know, equi, equi important level to containing the Soviets and retaining open market system, and you know, uh, pushing forward open open economic system. So the fact that the U.S. is even considering given, giving giving uh, Saudis an ability to reprocess uh, nuclear fuel, which you know. Everybody might say, or Israel might say, that this is solely for peaceful program and there will be inspections. But I don't believe that will remain the case. I mean, this is at least not uh, not explicitly discarding the possibility of that Saudis will will obtain nuclear weapons. So you have this. Then when we, when we go back to the strategic situation in the Middle East, you have at least three three powers vying in competition for who's le- who's the leader over uh, the Muslim world, right? You have the traditional competitors in Turkey and, and Iran, and then you have Saudis. So it's a very peculiar situation. When it comes to differences, look, we, we, we wondered uh, whether Israel is operating in a more or less permissive environment than Poland. Right, because yeah, basically, I think that the uh, the, the differences as uh, follows: Israeli operates in a more permissive environment than Poland because of absence of great powers lo- locked in, like Russia, Germany, or other great powers of Europe, including the the form of this you know quasi state European Union thing, and the U.S. Pres- presence in Europe as also external great power residing in Europe in a way. In Middle East, it's more wobbly, and there are no great powers. And Israeli has had a, 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 an indigenous capabilities. It has had indigenous foreign policy unrelated to alliances or collective uh, reassurances or collective uh, alliances and security arrangements. And as a small country with little demography and without strategic depth, it has tended to preemptively act aggressively by knocking out all threats that even are born or are nascent without being ripe yet and trying to eliminate by using also the, the brute force also in a form of this, this active defense out of beyond the borders of israel this has been also a, a similar trade over the course of history by all countries similar to to israel they tend to behave like that and uh, so that means that it seems that Israeli so far has had a, a free hand in dealing with Gaza. But, and this is the most important observation that I want to make, is 
Because in all wars, contemporary wars, you need to control the escalation and you need to make sure that the burden of escalation is not upon you because you you distract, you destroy your capability to make alliances, even handy alliances for for different things. Because in the public opinion, if you over escalate, like cutting off electricity and supplies to Gaza and pushing them to the sea, pushing the two million world population to the sea, it's the um, it's an excess of escalation. It's an excess of of waging war. Uh, at least these are the signals. Plus difficulties in in running the operation, ground operations against Gaza. I think it has had uh, created uh, an impression, or at least a feeling among the Israeli elites, that they need to think twice before moving in full scale into Gaza. But at the same time, they need to demonstrate military dominance somehow. They haven't shown it yet. And they haven't created this, uh, this conditions permitting them to terminate the contract, the, the war, on their choosing and on their terms. So it's I a mean, very difficult strategic uh, difficult situation because they also, the Israeli government also has to tend to internal considerations, right? And how it's perceived, how it caters to, to you know, to, to, to internal expectations of the, of the Israeli society. Right, so there is there is this problem. There is the fact that you know this this operation by Hamas. It was a very sophisticated operation, right? Uh, Hamas hasn't done anything like this for ever, really. Because first they've been you know they've been doing suicide bombings, right, from the first Intifada. Then they've been doing some small scale rocket launches. But this was a you know this was kind of joint operation, <laughs> you know, by air, land, and sea. Mm, at the end of the day, you know, small scale, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, joint operation. So clearly somebody must have provided Hamas with those capabilities. And also this was kept under the radar of Israeli uh, security, right? Apparatus, which is the most interesting capability that Hamas has shown because to, um, to keep operation like this under the tabs and not alarm the Israelis, this is what you really... Uh, uh must consider uh you know a skill that is that is hard to acquire right this isn't easy so the question is whether hamas has been able to do it ind- indigenously or whether it has been provided with it was provided with support by for example iran because this you know that sort of asymmetric operations this is like what iran or iranian proxies have been doing for a long time so then and then you see you know two carrier strike groups right in the eastern mediterranean and marine expeditionary unit uh, or force uh, also heading towards that direction. So you wonder about the prospects of potential further escalation into a uh, regional war. And then the question becomes, how thinly spread can the US become, right? And this is this is the moment when you wonder whether the U.S. can juggle all the crises concurrently at the moment when it's really at its weakest. Uh, yeah, Joe Biden, uh, President Biden said, uh, "Sure, they, they can." Sure, but you know, because they well, are the most. Well, he the can't most really powerful. say. Sure, 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 he said that. I mean, we're the most powerful, and sure, we can support Ukraine and Israel at the same time. But what is he supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, sure. we're, we're screwed, guys. I mean, we're not. We're not being able to juggle all those. This is an interesting. When I, I remember when we played our. Uh, simulations and war games and one of them in a couple of them i was i was playing the us and what what made the situation untenable for me was the moment when a few conflicts would all overlap with one another and spread my strategic attention so thin that i wasn't really able to uh to keep everybody in check and this is where all of a sudden you have uh you know cascading inability to tend to one theater and then to another and then to another so now you know you have obviously uh, a negative dynamic in Ukraine. You have a real possibility of uh, unless Israel manages its escalation in, Ga- in in Gaza, but then how does it retain political support without you know impacting severe punishment yeah. or afflicting inflicting severe punishment of, on, on 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 Hamas leadership? 
and the U.S. is is in between the industrial base, U.S. military industrial uh, defense industrial base is in shambles, right? And you have, you always have Taiwan. But apart from Taiwan, you also have tensions, growing tensions between Philippines and China over uh, Scarborough show, Mm -hmm. which again was the show that the US in 2012 instructed, as per previous Filipino president, instructed to hand over to China or not to fight over. And now Filipino stakeholders have have been talking about the need to reclaim it so the question is at which point and whether the US is able to keep its strategic attention uh, on all those theaters at the same time. Yeah, Elbridge Col- Elbridge- What happens if they aren't? Elbridge Colby claims that they can't. Basically, there are a few already camps uh, within DC com- security community. Old Empire camp that advocates for involvement everywhere to sustain the American primacy in all corners of the world, including the Middle East and Western Pacific, and of course the um, European theater, uh, claiming that, you know, the um, the empires don't uh, withdraw. They might fall, but they don't don't withdraw. And the U.S. Oceanic Empire has been with us for at least 30 years. And the um, you know, the second camp is the isola, isola, isolationism camp that they say we need to withdraw. We need to, you know, we have very good position in the Western Hemisphere, you know, but they tend to forget about the position of the U.S. dollar in the international market. And without it, and without the fiat money that America produces, the U.S. dollar is based. It, it is not correlated to the gold. It is hedged and anchored on the feeling of American geopolitical omnipotence and its power. Once it's gone, once U.S. credibility is gone, the U.S. dollar is gone. And with it, the U.S. fiscal and debt situation is dire. So the, also the, the isolationism camp have some, you know, should think twice. And there is also this sort of China first camp like Elbridge Colby that think that we shouldn't be, the, you know, derailed by some events in Europe and even Middle East, and we should focus on China because this is it. This is the, the thing that will change the future of the United States. Because the question, are, yeah, go go ahead. The question is whether, and you know, this is the point. I probably disagree with Elbridge Colby, but this assumes that Europe will be able to form some sort of coherent strategy. Because if, because if it's not, then maybe Colby's right, but. And again, I'm not sure. The question is whether you can really tend to only one end of Eurasia and forget about the other one and not risk the possibility that left to its own devices, Europe will gun for creating this, you know, or will accept, you know, objectively, economically rational offer of creating some sort of economic architecture across Eurasia from Lisbon to Beijing. Um, you know, then this is one reason why the U.S. should remain seized on 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 supporting the bulwark to this expansion, because I'm sure Germans, you know, Germans not only will will never agree to terminating its economic relationship with China, but the Germans will also gone for recreating uh, access. To Russian hydrocarbons as soon as possible, because again, they can't really live without it. Yeah. So if you forego Europe and think Europe will sort of remain in the Atlantic camp, I think that's a that's a huge mistake. I think in Europe's in Western Europe's rational self-interest is to, especially in absence of competing U.S. offer, and there is no competing U.S. offer when it comes to access to U.S. markets. U.S. economy is not what it was after the end of Second World War. In Europe's, in Western Europe's, well-defined self-interest uh, is to is to obtain uh, uphold economic ties with China, no matter what the U.S. says about it. So, in this sense, if you try to focus on China, you still lose the game. Yeah. So at the end of our conversation, what what do you bet the the, the Israelis will invade Gaza to the to the you know, seaside? What do you think? 
I think they will make some incursion just to show military dominance, but in a soft spot where there are not so many tunnels and uh, there there is a prediction that they might easily win and demonstrate in the, new, in the news and media that they have entered, they eliminated so many and you know so forth of uh, Hamas fighters, and then they will show restraint and sell it. Uh, uh, and maybe they will be killing uh, individually, you know, the leaders of Hamas Leadership. without going fully, you know, but they will present it in media as a full scale do military dominance without re doing a real fight. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, other strategy, I think, will be highly risky from the military operational point of view, from the grand strategy point of view, and the long term structural forces that Israel should be willing to push to its favor but like realigning with Saudi Arabia and not disrupting those ties to, to create the proper balance of power for itself and splitting Saudis from Iran if they fail to achieve that the living space for Israel it will shrink regardless of what's happening in Gaza now and I think this is the uh, this is the uh, the strategic implication that the Israeli government has, over the last couple of days, started to grasp, to understand, if they are savvy enough. Especially that there could be, you know, I, I know Israel occupied uh, Gaza, right? And then Sharon unilaterally withdrew forces, right? Withdrew settlers also, or like forced settlers to leave. But, you know... Uh, Look, I don't know enough about force disposition, but what about a scenario where Israel is not able really to neutralize Gaza, right? That's a catastrophic scenario, especially that you not only have Gaza, but you also have, uh, you know, Even the West Bank, West you Bank, might have Lebanon. Iran proxies in Syria and Lebanon. So what happens if they if they get bogged down in Gaza? You yeah. have a really dangerous situation for Israel as well. Yeah, exactly. And then what would the U.S. say? Because the U.S., you know, would also, I would imagine, fear entrapment into a regional conflict. I'm not sure they want to fight that war. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's let's end at this moment. Uh, Albert Fijinski, Jacek Bartosiak, Strategy and Future, stick with us. Thanks.